This used to be a passenger depot on the Illinois Central Railroad. Today, it's the Arcola Depot, a visitor center and museum. Inside, all the way from London, England, is one of the largest collections of brushes in the world. If you're wondering why brushes are so important to Arcola, just watch our next story. Then climb aboard the Illinois Terminal Railroad and travel back to a time when an electric interurban railroad still ran in central Illinois. They had already been informed that when the broom corn cutting was going to start. So them trucks would bring them Johnnies in here from, from Kentucky and, and uh, Tennessee. A lot, of, a lot of them come from in there. They, of course, they come from other parts of the country too, but uh, most of them come out of Tennessee and Kentucky. They always get to town by a week before harvest come and die, and they, They'd come up in Southern Illinois on what they call the ride the blinds on your passenger train. And then they'd just sleep out there in the, well, Humboldt and Arcoal in the park, you know. Had their shirts and things used for a pillow. Once upon a time, Central Illinois was the broom cord growing capital of the world. The broom corn plant is grown for its bristles. They're used to make natural brooms. About 1856, an Arcola farmer, Colonel John Coffer, planted some broom corn seed on his farm and found this climate and soil produced a great broom corn crop. His neighbors soon followed suit. Patrick Henry Monahan saw an opportunity, brought in some buyers from Chicago and out east, and started the first broom corn brokerage in central Illinois. His great grandson still run the business. Arcola soon became the hub of a thriving broom corn industry. In 1898, the town held the first homecoming celebration and erected a broom cord palace in the middle of Main Street. It took three weeks to build, was two stories tall, and you could drive a wagon and a team of horses through it. Every year in late August, as harvest approached, Arcola, Humboldt, and neighboring towns were suddenly flooded by flocks of migrant workers who came to harvest the broom corn crop. They were called broom corn johnnies. Albert Rippey moved to Arcola in 1928. He cut his first stock of broom corn soon after that and then did it every fall for who knows how long. Well, everybody knew when broom corn cutting was, was uh, coming around, you know, because back in the Depression, in the early part before the Depression, broom corn cutting and corn shucking was about the only two things that was valuable to a labor around this part of the country. I mean, that was the two main things other than as, as, as a farmhand. I'd say probably the Dean Hillegas of Tuscola first cut broom corn when he was only 10 or 12 years old. His father grew broom corn and would take a wagon into town and come back with 15 or 20 Johnnies for the day's harvest. My dad always said the money maker crop for him. He always, he, he, I think he got two thirds of it. And the other guy, the landlord got a third. The beginning of broom corn was when you go out there and you break a table and you'd back down through a field, most, uh, most of the tables was a quarter mile long, and uh, you'd back down through a table and, and uh, break uh, heads over each side of the table, see, and they made it about three feet high, or depends on the height of the man, and uh, when they get the quarter mile broke through, uh, then they'd come back and cut one side of that off, the heads of it, and lay it up on the table, and when they got the other end, then they'd cut back on the other side and lay that up on the table. They haul, the, they haul the stuff in around the cedar on rack wagons, old iron wheels, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they was a dump wagon is what they was. So they, uh, each guy on each side of the wagon would, would uh, pick it off the table and lay it up on the wagon. And they'd cross it like this so it wouldn't slip off, because it was slick. One quarter of a mile would make a load of broom corn, and they'd take that in and uh, dump it somewhere around the cedar. And uh, after they got all, uh, all of it hauled in that uh, was to be seeded that night, why, 
then they'd have a crew of people that cut all day long and that would uh, work, hourly work, getting this seeded up. Besides the seeding process, the broom corn harvest has never been successfully mechanized. The seeding machine was essentially a box with rotating cylinders full of fingers, the whole thing powered by a belt running from a tractor. The rotating fingers knocked the seeds off the bristles, and what came out the other side was broom corn brush. After drying, the brush was used to make brooms. They'd lay it on tables, as long as they had a bunch of long tables there. And then it was a feeder that always fed the broom corn cedar. And when it got up to feeder, then he'd bump it down and run it through the cedar. And the thrasher would come out the other end, and they had a bunch of crew on the other end of it that would take it off of the machine and take it into the broom corn shed where there would be somebody putting it on the slats. After everything was dry, then it had about the same amount, taking it off the shelves, bringing it out to the baler. There'd be a guy in the baler stomping it. He'd take it from them and put it in there, and he'd step on it and keep building it up. And then after it got so high, they'd shut the gate of the baler. And then when they got it so full, they would pull uh, the lid down on top of it and they'd clamp, clamp it down tight. Then there was a horse out there on a turn table that would pull that bottom up, press it in, and the, the guys that fed the balers would be there with what they call pounders, and they beat that until it got up tight as they wanted it. Flip the gate up, two of them would roll the bale out, and then somebody would stack it or load it on a truck or something. Harvest lasted only about a month, but that was long enough. It was hot, dirty, boring, and itchy work. The pay the Johnnies spent while they were in town helped fuel a boom at local stores, taverns, and restaurants. And for farmers like Dean Hillegas's dad, growing a crop of broom corn meant cash. Dad, he make brooms in the winter time. Well, he didn't like to sell them. Well, I'd, if we had an old 29 and Ford, I'd load her down. I'd take off not a dime in my pocket, but I'd always come back with a little cash. But Well, we'd trade them maybe. Hey, well, if I had to have the gas, I'd pay it even for a gallon of gas to get going, you know. Maybe the, the next guy give me five gallons for a gas. But it all depends. You had to do some trading. You had to make her go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you, if you run away from there with three dollars, you're lucky. Three or four dollars a day, including the, including the seeding up of an evening. But then as, it got, as time went on, you know, year after year, it increased. And at one time, I think the highest I ever got was $10 a table. World War II came, and the shortage of labor began the decline of broom corn growing in central Illinois. Fewer and fewer Johnnies showed up to harvest the crop. Farmers had to pay higher wages, and a new crop called soybeans began to look like a better alternative. By 1970, broom corn growing here had virtually stopped. It went out west to Colorado and Oklahoma, then to Mexico and overseas. But even without the broom corn harvest and the broom corn johnnies, Arcola is still the broom corn capital of the world. Broom making and broom corn businesses provide hundreds of jobs. And in a reincarnation of the broom corn johnny migration, thousands of tourists come to the annual broom corn festival every September to buy crafts, drink beer, and eat elephant ears where the broom corn palace once stood. Thank you.